morning, everyone, and thank you. It's really lovely to visit this space. It's beautiful. Um, and I'm really glad Michael went ahead of me because some of the earlier concepts he's covered, so we can go quickly into why I care about this so much. So um, I'm actually a medical oncologist, meaning I train to give chemotherapy. But about six months after exiting medical oncology, I decided that's not really what I wanted to do. And I went off to do a second fellowship in genomics because I very much believe that the way we actually win this battle uh, against cancer is actually upstream. Um, let me see if I can get this right. Okay, so what is genomic medicine? So genomic medicine is the emerging medical discipline that actually uses genomic information about an individual to do a couple of things. One is to assess health risk. One is to stratify disease. One is to guide clinical care, and then sometimes it's also used to direct treatment. But the idea of it is how can we use genomics to tailor care for that individual? Okay, so I think I don't want to belabor this point. You know, you always see in the press, cancer is the leading cause of death. But actually, it's very abstract when you say it that way. But when you actually put it into numbers, an average of 40 people are diagnosed with cancer every single day and one in four may develop cancer in their lifetime. This is today's statistics, right? But by 2030, I'm not sure whether I have the next slide, but, uh, but, but, but by 2030, that number goes up to one in three. This is because of um, you know, the way we've been living, but also because of the aging tsunami that's coming. Um, and so actually the time to act, is, as uh, Madam Rohana said, is, is actually yesterday, not really today or tomorrow, okay? And so I've spent a bit of time, to, like Michael, thinking about how do we actually stop this tsunami. So this is actually the Singapore Cancer Registry table. Um, as we was already mentioned, more than 50% of people with breast cancer are still presenting in only stage 3 and stage 4. That's really quite, um, you know, not quite acceptable and not quite ideal. So what we can try and do is to try and stop people uh, presenting in stage 3 and stage 4 and maybe move it upstream. Because as um, Madam Hana said, you know, stage one patients do so much better. So how is Singapore actually doing? If you actually compare with the US, uh, Singapore and China, the actual incidence is actually pretty similar. But the five-year survival lacks that of the US. And one of that reason is mainly the third line there, which is that 33% or less are actually being detected in stage one. So that really helps harness and focuses on what we should be doing as a community. How do we increase the percentage of people being detected in stage one, okay? And that, and that's in part because of the low screening rate that's already just been mentioned. Okay, the other way we can stop this tsunami, and this is why my clinics take very long, is to sort of change the mindset of patients um, and public that cancer is not caused by bad luck, okay? There are things we don't understand yet, and when we don't understand it, we might say it's bad luck, but when you actually go down and understand it, quite a big proportion of it is due to genetics, and I'll share a little bit more about that, but also your environment and your lifestyle. So there are many, many things you could do about that. So um, we've really talked about how at the current moment for population average risk screening, it's based on your gender, your woman, based on your age, you're 50, you go for your breast cancer uh, mammography, that's when it starts. Um, however, as uh, Michael's already mentioned, it doesn't take into account many of the other uh, risk factors, and that's one of the reasons why we are both working in this area. So one of the most commonly cited reasons uh, for why patients do not go for screening, one is it's not necessary, I'm very healthy. It's a very common mindset. The second one is no time to go for health screening, and the last is too expensive. I hate to tell uh, local public and, and the population, the last one is no longer uh, the case. Uh, the, I'm very pleased in the last five years, the direction of the whole medical community is going very much to preventative health. And the Screen for Life program really, really does address the last point. So we do need to address the first point and the second point. The first point is a harder one to address. It requires every one of us to reach out, to educate, to, to, to sort of have that, those discussions with not just patients, but just your neighbours about this. The no time to go for health screening, that one I think we can address. We can try and make it accessible for people to go for screening. So this is a slide I really like, um, which is that population risk is not individual risk, right? So what's average for everybody is not what's relevant to your, you, the person in front of me. So there are, as Michael already mentioned, protective factors, but there are also risk factors. And so how do we differentiate between those 
factors that keep you healthy and those factors that put you at risk. So that's kind of um, the work that we're both working on. Okay. Um, so I'm coming back to local data now. So when I speak to policymakers as well as other clinicians, uh, for the last 10 years, it's been quite hard to get traction, partly because we don't have the local data. How common is this? How big of a problem is this? But this has now uh, largely been addressed. Um, uh, we are both part of uh, projects that have been funded by a national uh, program called Precise, where we're trying to understand um, the genetic risk of individuals. So I'm going to present to you all, it's not even published yet, uh, the first 10,000 individuals that have gone through uh, genetic uh, uh, in the research study and what the results are for these individuals. So, um, wait, I might have missed one slide. Can you go back one? Oh, okay. All right. So, focusing only on three genes alone, which are the in the curve later, I'll show you again. These are the ones that are most penetrant, meaning that anyone with these genetic mutations they're the most likely to then develop breast cancer. Just focusing on this three alone, the number in this 10,000 individuals is one in 150 Singaporeans. This is a lot higher than I, I thought, and a lot higher than previously reported in previous literature. But previous literature um, did not, was not as comprehensive, didn't use the latest kind of sequencing technologies and that, uh, that we're using at this point in time. So this number is actually pretty high. It's no longer as rare as people think. So this means that our current breast screening guidelines may be incorrect for at least one in, one in 150 individuals. This is huge. So if we actually get this part correct for, for, for these individuals, we'll be going a long way in trying to prevent breast cancer. Okay. So um, I don't know whether any of you have been uh, you know, watching the news and all of that. This was, you know, we had Angelina Jolie as a champion for the longest time. Now we have Chris Abbott, right? Chris Abbott just came up. And, and, just, and, and she's loved by many in the tennis world. And she says that everybody needs to listen because her, her, her sister had ovarian cancer. And because of that, she went for, a, for a screening. And she found out that she, had, she also carried the BRCA1 mutation. And then she went for a prophylactic surgery and then identified to have early stage uh, ovarian cancer. So her, her story is very powerful. We have many such stories in our local setting. Unfortunately, it's not been easy getting local patients to share their story. So the reason why this is important for BRCA1 and BRCA2, in pink are the, the risks for, for them developing breast cancer and ovarian cancer. In grey is that of the normal population. It's a very high penetrant condition. It, it, the risk is very significant. Um, and there's also risk in the men as well. So the men are not spared. Okay, so it's important for them. So this graph is just to share with you that we now know enough that BRCA1 patients need to be managed a certain way. B but we, can also, we also now know enough that BRCA2 patients, for example, their ovarian cancer risk, which is on the red line, is a lot lower than the BRCA1. So we might be able to defer the, the prophylactic oophorectomy to after the menopause, and it's not as urgent than those with BRCA1. This is just an example of how such tailoring can help. Okay, so what I do is we see patients who are referred to us. Uh, we go through risk assessment. We go through a pre-test and post-test counseling with the patients, and then they decide whether this is something they want for themselves. Um, and and um, I would say that when we first started, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what this is all about. But over time, patients have now understand, and in general, about 80% of in, uh, individuals who come to our clinic actually go for testing. Okay, about 20% of them do not. Um, but they, they have the test done, then they come back for a results appointment and we go through how to manage these patients. So the other question policymakers ask is, does knowing your genetic risk make a difference to how people behave? We, don't, we need to repeat this study. This study was done when I first came back when the first group of about uh, 60 patients that we followed up with BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, we need to repeat it because now we have many, many more families. But based on that very first simple study that we did, 80% of the people who were BRCA1 and BRCA2 were sticking with their regimens. They were going for their mammograms, they were going for their prophylactic surgeries, they were going for their surveillance, they were going for what we recommended to them. That is, I, I think, very encouraging, that you can manage patients based on their genetics, and people will follow it if you give them the necessary education and the care. But we need to repeat the study, of course, because it was a very small one. Um, so in terms of take-home messages, I think it's important to know that we can take action. 
Um, I don't know whether you missed a knowledge is power sticker there. That's all over our clinic. Um, and that's all over things that we, we give people. Um, you need to be your own advocates uh, and know what you need and what screening you need at what time. Not everyone's the same. Um, the research is moving very, very fast, so keep updated. Um, keep in touch with, um, I mean, I, I, I keep in touch with a lot of my patients, but keep in touch with your team of doctors. And really, it's a team of doctors and not just a single doctor that should be looking after you at this point in time. So um, I'm going to finish by saying this is a slide I show all the time with my patient support groups, which is that um, we don't do this on our own. Um, we, we want to partner with the patients, the public, and the rest of it. And that, um, you, know, the, you know, this last one, we have many of our uh, patients coming forward to be part of driving the research agenda. So I would really welcome anyone here who's interested in this. Um, so this is something that we've done for the last three years, which is for patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. We have what's called a patient conference, where the patients come together and we, 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 we educate them and we update them, and they form a bit of a community. Um, uh, it's 15th of October. <laughs> we haven't quite planned out the activity yet because it's a very busy team that's doing everything. So we will do something, but it's on the 15th of October. I want to share two last slides because just as to highlight the point. I started as a single person doing this with one clinic a week. We now have clinics morning and night, um, uh, sorry, morning and afternoon for every single day in SGH, NCC, KK, Changi, uh, Sengkang Soon. So it's a huge problem. It's not a one. It's, it's not rare. It's, it's very common. I just want to highlight quickly that um, Diana speaks um, Malay, and um, Manasa, Malika, Samia speaks Tamil. Language is very important in this particular area. Getting people who can speak your your language is so important in explaining this. Um, that's it. I think the next one is just that's it. Thank you.